Kind of crazy to see it like this. There's usually just like a sea of people everywhere, but the WSOP has come to a close. I had an epiphany about this year's WSOP, and I think you guys are going to want to hear it. This actually might be one of the most important YouTube videos you see on tournament poker, so lock in. This place is just too insane. As you can see over my shoulder, there's the front door. There's an upstairs with uh, five bedrooms. There's four upstairs, one downstairs. Just a really cool place to call home during the WSOP. You guys probably know some of the players that we had in here this summer. Obviously one of them is my little brother. If you followed the channel at all, you would know my little brother. His name is Andrew Moreno. He's been a professional poker player for 20 years. He's really good at No Limit Texas Hold'em. And because of our friendship and his mentorship, I've always been pretty good at the game too. I've always kind of been a few steps behind Andrew in terms of our poker career. He started playing very young at the age of 19. I didn't even start playing until I was 24. And I learned the game 100% by watching Andrew play online. And eventually over 14 years ago, I quit my job to follow in Andrew's footsteps as a cash game professional poker player. And I was a cash game player primarily the whole entire time until the pandemic hit. As soon as the pandemic started to clear up, there was a bit of a poker boom and tournament poker especially was exploding. Every tournament stop was breaking records and my little brother, Andrew, that was the time that he decided he wanted to be a professional full-time tournament player and he cashed in. He went on an insane run where he was winning tournament after tournament, final tabling, racking up millions of dollars in a one year period and moving to number nine in the world rankings. And seeing this massive success so close to home from someone who I've always followed in their footsteps, it just made me think that I should also switch to tournament poker. I mean, when you think about it, everything that my brother's done in poker and cash games, I was able to replicate just a few years after him, so it only made logical sense in my mind. And honestly, the switch was paying off. I won $150,000 plus in that first year of playing tournaments full-time. I made a video about it on this channel talking about the pitfalls and some of the things that I went through as a tournament player in that first year. So now this is my second World Series of Poker of playing tournaments full time. If you rewind back to last year, I broke even over the entire summer, about 50K in buy-ins, about 50K in cashes. So I was really looking to do better than that this year, especially having this house with the camaraderie of other poker players grinding the WSOP. And like I said, it was definitely a bucket list item from the time I first started playing poker to be a tournament player to grind the World Series, to have a big space like this with friends to share in the experience with. And it did not disappoint. We had so much fun this summer, but now the house is empty and it's time to recap what happened. How did I do? Well, you could probably infer from the title of this video that it did not go great. It did not go terribly. The results are definitely not what I hoped they would be. Let's hop in and look at the stats. During the WSOP, I played $52,000 in buy-ins, including online WSOP bracelet event. And I cashed for $36,445.12, which includes winning a $10,000 seat into the main event. So that put my total losses for tournaments at the WSOP at $15,221.88. Now I didn't exactly track the number of hours played, but if I had to guess, I'd probably say somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 hours, which means means I lost around $100 an hour. Now, if you contrast that with the two cash game sessions that I played this summer, I played for about 10 hours and I won around 8,500, which you can do the math there. I won around $844 an hour in those two sessions. And this is kind of indicative of how cash games are versus tournaments. Tournaments have wild variants. You go on long stretches of losing, it's completely normal. In cash games, the variance is much lower and you can have a more sustained hourly. Obviously you can't have massive scores like you can in tournaments, but at the stakes I play, you can definitely do well for yourself. I've been thinking a lot about how I wanna package this video and I think that sharing this one hand from the last tournament that I played at the WSOP. It was a bracelet event, $500 online event with 
nearly a thousand players in it and we were down under a hundred players player raised in middle position i defended from the big blind with queen six of hearts off of a 20 big blind stack i know this is the correct play this part is easy memorizing pre-flop ranges isn't too difficult so defending for men with pretty much any suited hand is going to be the standard play here so the flop comes five three three with two spades and one heart i have a backdoor flush draw backdoor straight draw and it I check it over to the original Razor and he puts out a C bet, a small one. So what should I do here? What's the correct play? Uh, if you're a new tournament player, you might think we have nothing. It's probably best to fold here, especially on a short stack, 20 big blinds. But if you've done some study, you probably realize you're definitely not supposed to fold here. Your options are calling or raising. And since I have done some study work, I knew this and I thought, it would probably be split around 50 50 so i decided to go with the more aggressive route and i raised i was a bit off with the 50 50 assumption but the solver still says raising is a fine play here our opponent made the call and the turn came the king of hearts okay we added a flush draw it's an over card what are we supposed to do here now uh i'll give you my end game thoughts i thought that because it would be a bad card for our opponent and because we just had queen high, and because we had a one-to-one -one stack to pot ratio with our bet sizing, basically if I move all in here on the turn, it is a full pot size bet, maximize my fold equity, hopefully get a fold here. If we don't get a fold, obviously we can win with a, a heart on the river. So I did that, I moved all in, but it turns out that was a mistake. I definitely should not have done that. Here's the thing is that poker players make mistakes all the time and sometimes it's a competence issue. And in this case, it was a competence issue because I actually did not know what the correct play was. I didn't know what the solver would do in the situation. And after running it back, looking at GTO wizard, it said that I should be checking here on the turn. And the simple truth is, is that 99% of poker players would not have known that after raising here and the king of hearts comes on the turn, they would have not have known that this is a 100% check here on the turn. And that's totally fine. You don't have to be a solver nerd to be a winning tournament player. But when you look at guys like my brother, Andrew, he just knows these things. Like he spends so much time studying. He knows that if I'm raising this flop and this card comes on the turn, he knows that it's probably gonna be a check here. So the study matters so much in these small situations. For example, here, I moved all in. We got called by ace, queen of spades. I busted the tournament after bricking off on the river and I'm out in 85th place. If I would have played my hand as a call and then a check, check, probably on turn, we're talking results here, but this is also lining up with optimal play. And I would have lost the hand most likely, but I wouldn't have lost my whole stack. And that is really frustrating to know that if I would have just put in more study work, I could have avoided this situation or I could have maintained my stack. And it was kind of an epiphany in my own mind is like, even though I've been playing for a living for nearly 15 years, I still need to study tournament poker as if it's day one for me. I need to basically give it my all. My epiphany was, if you want to be an elite tournament player like my brother, I have the blueprint. I've seen what he's done. I've seen how often he studies. I've seen the work that he does inside of the solvers. He knows the frequencies. He knows the ranges. He, he knows the board textures. He knows the bet sizings. And I haven't put in enough of the work to know these things to be an elite player. So like I said, the epiphany was, if I want to do this, I have to give it my all and I have to go all in with studying solvers. So I came to the realization, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to make studying tournament poker my entire life? Because right now I'm in the place where I'm good at poker. I'm good at tournament poker. I'm a winning player. But in order for me to be one of the best, I can't continue to do what I'm doing. And do I really want to deal with the variance? I've seen it firsthand with my brother. I've seen it with Daniel Negreanu. He posts World Series of Poker vlogs every year where he documents how his buy-ins are compared to how his caches are. And last year he lost over a million dollars, $1.1 million playing tournaments. He's one of the best in the world. This year he lost a million dollars again playing tournaments during the WSOP. Like I said, one of the best in the world. So nobody is immune to the variance. So after thinking about what it takes to be elite in terms of studying solvers and what it takes to withstand the variance with the ups and downs, 
You probably guessed it from the title of this video. We're going back to cash games. So not clickbait. Yes, I am more or less quitting tournament poker. I'll always play tournaments here in Vegas because I live here. So if there's a high value tournament, I'm probably going to play it. For instance, the main event, the WPT in December, but we're not gonna be traveling to the Bahamas again. We're not gonna be traveling abroad. I'm not gonna go overseas. So here's the thing guys is I obviously still love studying, but I just don't want to make it my life. I love making YouTube videos. I want to be able to continue to do that. And back to something that I said in the very beginning of the video, how this might be one of the most important YouTube videos you watch on tournament poker. I firmly believe that because living with my brother and seeing his work ethic and seeing how he studies, I had the blueprint on what it takes to be a elite top tournament poker player in the world. If you wanna be elite, you're gonna to have to study solvers and you're gonna to have to study them all the time. And from my experience, I've used range converter. I've recommended range converter in the past. I've just switched to GTO wizard because of the implementation of Ruse, the AI software that they just purchased. It's just an invaluable piece of software that was not available a couple years ago. So I'll drop a link in the description. Like I said, not sponsored, but if you do use my link, you get 10% off. Something that actually just blows my mind that's, that's available. So anyways, yes, we are in this house for one last day. I'm gonna show you guys the backyard real quick. And then I am taking off, going to the airport and working on some YouTube videos. Gonna do a little bit of traveling before we hop back into the live stream mix. I've actually been playing on some live streams and been winning money lately, big amounts of money. So I'm excited to share some of that here on the YouTube channel. Just wanna say thank you guys so much for riding with me. We did not get them in tournaments this summer, but we're gonna get them back in cash games and we're gonna have a lot of fun creating content on YouTube. I'll see you guys in a poker room near you.